All right. So good evening. Welcome to the Jackson Project Summer Lecture Series, which is a partnership between uh, the Jackson Project, Library of Virginia, and Richmond Public Libraries. Um, you know, really quickly, Jackson Project really began uh, with an inquiry from the Africana Independent Film Festival, which is uh, led by Anjali Moon. She came to me and said um, she wanted to do 10 facts across the city uh, as she had to pivot to virtual because of the pandemic and one of them that she would one of the spaces that she was going to uh, project in is Jackson Ward and we are two black girls from Richmond Virginia and just could not even imagine that we did not know who the Jackson and Jackson was um, or in, in Jackson Ward was and so this began a long journey um, in partnership with Library of Virginia to try to get to the bottom of who is Jackson and from that the Jackson project started as you know a single fact and has grown into a project that we did Define as reparative historic preservation through restorative truth telling and redemptive storytelling. And it's been a pleasure to be able to partner with Library of Virginia and Rich Public Libraries all summer to kind of highlight all of the work being done across Jackson Ward uh, um, that's related to its full arc as a community. And so tonight we'll be discussing the Virginia Way. Um, and we have an action-packed panel for you guys. First up, our moderator. We have Dr. Zoe Spencer. She is a freedom fighter and an educator who has dedicated her life to addressing oppression in all of its forms. She is a humble woman. She just wants to go by Zoe, but she is Emmy award-winning lecturer from Virginia State University. She is a well-respected uh, expert in the legal and criminal justice space. Her work has been featured in the likes of documentaries by uh, um, uh, the 13th and say her name. Um, she is also a mother and she's a grandmother. And so I have to give you your flowers. Okay. Yeah. You know, so you're a big deal. And so that's our moderator for the evening. You're in for a treat. Next up, we have Dr. Laurenette Lee. Uh, she too is a celebrated public historian across the city. She served as the founding curator of African-American history at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, where she helped to launch a genealogical tool called Unknown No Longer, a database of Virginia slave names. In 2008, she published Making the American Dream, a cultural history of African-Americans in Hopewell, Virginia. She serves on several boards and is a uh, well-tapped consultant across the city and most recently she became a community trust building fellow with initiatives of change and with initiatives of change. In 2017, uh, Mayor Stoney actually appointed Dr. Lee to the Monument Avenue Commission. And in the following year, the president at the University of Richmond appointed her to the Presidential Commission on University History and Identity. And during her time and in, in that position, she actually helped to uh, lead a study on institutional history research. And she really took a deeper dive on the subjects of enslavement, race, and segregation. Dr. Lee, it is a complete honor to have you on this panel. Uh, next up, we have Provost Brooke Berry. Uh, she has spent over 10 years working in higher education administration. She is devoted to improving the quality of life and experiences for college students. She currently serves as Assistant Vice Provost for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion within the Division of Student Affairs at Virginia Commonwealth University. Brooke holds a Juris Doctorate from the University of Iowa and a Bachelor's Degree from North Carolina a t She is also very active in her community as my soror, as a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, She's also a member of the Lynx and Jack and Jill of America. She's born and raised here in Richmond, Virginia. She loves spending time with her family to include her husband and her son. Brooke, it is a complete honor to have you here, provost. Um, next up, we have Dr. Greg Kimball, who I randomly met in the library almost a year ago, trying to figure out who is Jackson and Jackson Ward. He is the Director of Public Services and Outreach at the Library of Virginia, where he, where he is responsible for research services, exhibitions, programs, and education at the institution. He holds a PhD uh, in history from UVA, as well as degrees from University of Maryland College Park. He is the author of American City, Southern Place, a cultural history of antebellum Richmond. He's also a curator. He also uh, previously served as a curator and historian at the Valentine and the chief historian during the Valentine's restoration and interpretation of Tredegar Ironworks. He performs widely in a variety of traditional styles as it relates to music, um, everything ranging from blues and Hawaiian. And he uh, has mus musical endeavors that uh, have led him to be on the committee for the Richmond Folk Festival. And also he is a veteran of the United States Army, which I did not know. Thank you for your service. 
All right, next up we have Professor Is, or AKA the big homie. Um, <laughs> Uh, Professor is, he is a history and social science teacher, instructional coach, and instructional specialist. Currently coordinating history programming across the school district in Richmond, Virginia. He is a teacher center leader. Professor is carries full endorsements and licenses in history and social sciences and a certification in advanced Spanish. He also holds a double major BA in education and history, a double content master's degree in teaching and learning, and an EDS in curriculum and instruction. He is an adjunct faculty member at U of R in the Department of Education and the host of Leading by History podcast, where he lectures on what he coins uh, real history, which emphasizes a, cha a challenging of prevailing narratives about history in order to uncover truths, which is a perfect segue into tonight's topic. Um, but also, he is the brainchild and architect behind Real Richmond History Curriculum at Richmond Public Schools. And we've been a, a it's been a pleasure to partner with you um, in your work. So thank you for your service and just thank you for being you. And he's also from the West End. You know, I got to throw it up. We used to for Bird Park. All right, next up, we have Christina Vita. She is an Elise H. Wright Curator of General Collections at the Valentine Museum. Christina Vita is responsible for the museum's objects collection, as well as the Wilkham House. As a project manager for the Valentine Studio Project, she is collaborating on the reinterpretation of Edward Valentine's Lost Cause Sculpture Studio on the museum's campus. Vita received her BA in History from the College of William and Mary in 2005, and an MA from the Winter Third Program in American Material Culture at the University University of Delaware. She has previous work experience in curatorial and education roles at George Washington's Mount Vernon, Windsor Historical Society, and the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, and has contributed to exhibitions at the VMFA and Black History Museum and Cultural Center of Virginia. Um, this is going to make for a really dope conversation considering um, your work too. And so that is our panel. I hope that you guys are ready. Uh, Dr. Zoe, Dr. Spencer Zoe, uh, Freedom Fighter, sis, the floor is yours. Wow. First, I want to give a standing ovation. <clears throat> I'm truly honored and humbled to even be moderating this panel with such distinguished colleagues. Um, and so I'm going to jump right in. Um, interestingly, Dr. Moon, um, Dr. Kimball said that she met you um, in the library on a humble when she was inquiring about who is Jackson. So it's only fitting that we start with you. The Jackson Project began with, began with her inquiry, who is Jackson? Can you tell us about your personal origin story and how it led you to your work and or your institution? Great, well, thank you so much. And again, this is a fantastic panel. I'm so excited to be part of it. Um, I grew up in a little town, not far from Canada in New Hampshire. I'm probably the, one of the few non-Richmonders, I think, on the panel. And uh, so uh, my in New England's a funny place. It's kind of like Virginia. It's very history oriented. And I got a lot of history, a lot of which I would later find out was maybe not quite right. And we'll talk about that later. But I think the biggest experience that led me to what I do now was when I went in the military. And, uh, you know, I left a town that was very provincial, very small, and I found out what America was about. <laughs> you know, I, I, I met people from uh, all over the country, from cities, from towns, the South, the West, uh, you, even, you know, a lot of people don't realize, but the, I, I had a roommate who was from Pakistan. Uh, so it, it was really an amazing experience for me. It meant living in the South and then eventually in Europe. And it really gave me kind of a bigger vision of, you know, this is a fascinating world. And, and I also saw a lot of conflict as after post Vietnam, and there was a lot of racial strife, you know, within the military at the time, a lot of misogyny. And it made me really realize that, you know, these are things that are important to understand, to learn from. And so I would say that was really one of the things that led me to do what I do now. Thank you so much. The big homie professor is, I would definitely, real history. So I would definitely like to get your take on it. Who is Jackson and tell us about your personal origin story and what led you to the work that you're doing? Well, I, I think Jackson 
um, though there's been historical dispute, right, over the uh, over the uh, the origin of the name for our, our mighty neighborhood, Jackson Ward. I think who is Jackson is a is a much bigger question. But I, I think the second part of what you asked ties into how did we become? Because you know, it reminds me of uh, at the end of the movie Malcolm X, where everybody stood up, the kids stood up, and said, "I am Malcolm X. I am Jackson." Right. In other words what is it that helped me to become who I am? You know, that's code word for, for who is Jackson. Um, and I think, you know, for me, from the time I was probably nine or 10 years old, um, I was always infatuated with history, with knowledge. Uh, I grew up in a time period where the artists were KRS-One, you know, knowledge reigns supreme over nearly everyone. Uh, Big Daddy Kane, King Asiatic, nobody's equal. I grew up in a time of knowledge of self, right? And so we were, um, you know, in our neighborhood, we, we, we had to know certain facts, certain ideas. We had to be up with what the, the standard of the culture was. And so from the time I was young, I was infatuated with history. And by the time I was 15, I was actually planning uh, history programs in the city of Richmond, things down at the Amani Temple. Uh, you know, back in the early 90s, putting together programs where I had different Black nationalist groups and, and, and religious groups coming together to, to, you know, give information to the public. So, you know, this has been a part of who I have been from the time I was a youngin. And so when I think about who is Jackson and what is the journey, it's really, it's really about us thinking about how will we be an inspiration for the next generation of people. You know, how do we inspire students to ask the question, who is Jackson? In other words, who am I? See, it's not about, you know, really at the at the core of it, uh, whether it, the, the neighborhood was named after this person or that person, we know the power of the neighborhood. We know the people that the neighborhood produced. And that's where the power really comes from. And so I think for me, I, I want to continue to embody what it means to search for yourself, to learn more about you and your past and the history of your people and how you uh, fit into this, this modern world. And so that to me is what who is Jackson, you know, means to me. That was exceedingly powerful. And I got about 10 questions that I would like to ask after that. I mean, you just, you just dug into the root of it all, but I'm going to come back. Um, Dr. Barry, I wanted to hear your thoughts and, and your journey. You know, that, that's hard to follow up, and I'm reflecting upon that, too. And I think that's part of my origin story. I'm a, I'm a third-generation Richmonder. Uh, my grandmother was actually uh, born in a home that was in Jackson Ward. And so I attended both Richmond and Henrico Public Schools. But you talk about um, that knowledge of self. I had the amazing utopian experience of attending the number one public HBCU in the country. North Carolina a &T. Um, and so that's where I really discovered myself and had a full appreciation of who I was as a Black woman. I really was equipped with the tools and the education and the network to be successful. And uh, my father is a practicing attorney here in Richmond, and he encouraged me to go to law school. Um, but the experiences that I had in law school, in that PWI, in that um, institution that was not created to serve me um, were so different um, than the culture of care and love and respect that I had experienced um, at a and And so once I graduated from college and it was time, excuse me, from law school and it was time to figure out what I would do next, I was sure that I didn't want to practice, but I knew that I did want to be an advocate. I knew that I did want to help people. Um, and then I considered higher ed because I knew that I wanted to be to those students who I needed when I was in college and who I needed in law school. And so the majority of my work has been focused on facilitating um, just and redemptive and equitable outcomes for students in crisis. Um, I've worked as a dean of students um, and now uh, I have been at VCU for a month. Um, in this new role, Centering Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Student Affairs. Um, and so I started in Richmond. I was born here, and I'm back here for a purpose. Um, and I'm so excited to continue to reflect and ask myself who is Jackson and how, how I fit into all of this. 
360 degrees following the purpose brings you right back. Congratulations, congratulations. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and um, give you the uh, North Carolina uh, HBCU, I, I, I'm Howard, so we, we sisters, we sisters and brothers. Um, I wanted to um, get Dr. Lee and our expert, Christina Vita, in on the next question. Um, the Jackson Project is rooted in celebrating the 150th anniversary of Jackson Ward. What has the ward meant to you, your work, and or your institution over the past 150 years? I'll start with you, um, Dr. Lee, and then Ms. Vita. You're on mute, sis. Thank you. Thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Spencer. I want to back up just a little bit, go to the origin story. I'm from Chesterfield. And those of us who are from the county always make sure you understand we are your neighbors and we are here. Um, and I grew up in a time when the schools were becoming desegregated entered what we call the white school in the fourth grade when we studied Virginia history. And I was the only black child in the class. And when we got to the chapter that we talked about the slaves, I realized I was the only one that looked like what was in the picture. And it was during a time when the other children didn't play with me. It was hell on the school bus because they were throwing spitballs and saying things. And I wondered, why do they hate us so much? And I lost all interest in history until I heard a professor speak, the late Dr. Edgar Toppin. And it, it, that is what really made me see history from a different perspective. I had gone away, lived in Chicago and Atlanta. And when I came back to teach, uh, to substitute teach, I saw that they weren't teaching history any differently than when I was in school. And when I heard Dr. Toppin speak, I realized this was an opportunity for me to learn about history from the ground up and share it with the larger public, not just those in the academy, but the community, the churches, the civic organizations, families even. And so that is much of how I have fashioned my life, my, my professional life. Um, when I think about Jackson Ward, I think about it from someone who comes from the county. Richmond was the big city. We only really went there to go shopping, you know, in the stores that would let us in. But because my family came from farming families, we were self-sufficient. We didn't have to go into Richmond, but we heard about the things that were happening in Richmond. We heard about Jackson Ward and we didn't hear all of the good that came out of Jackson Ward because of the times we lived in, because in fact of the Virginia way. When you think about how uh, wards, districts, communities were portrayed in the newspaper by white editors, it was not portrayed in the best light. And so that is the understanding I had of Jackson Ward until much later when I became a board member at the Department of Historic resources um, instead on the state review board. And I learned about uh, Jackson Ward. And now we're learning a much fuller uh, and more inclusive history of Jackson Ward because of the work that is currently being done by the Moon Sisters and so many of the scholars now. OK, I realize as a historian, I just went over my two minutes, but no, it was. It, there's no. Look, listen, you all are really, really putting the knowledge down. So do not, do not apologize. I just got about five questions from what you said as well. But before I circle back, um, Christina Vita, if you wanted to jump in, 
Absolutely. Thanks. So and just want to um, thank all of the, the panelists and the attendees tonight for joining in in this in this conversation. Um, I myself grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, in a very upper middle class white suburban setting, um, which is exactly what y'all are imagining right now. Um, and continued in that strain uh, at William and Mary during my undergrad years. Um, and really had not heard of Jackson Ward uh, until we relocated to Richmond in 2017 and I joined the staff at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. Um, and so these last four years have been a wonderful exploration for me for learning about the history of Richmond and how critical Jackson Ward has been to the city's history. Um, I think also specifically for the Valentine, and, and I'm gonna answer the question less for me and more for the Valentine, um, that as early as 1902, the Valentine Museum um, committed to being open to all students from Richmond Public Schools. That means the black students and the white students. Um, we, they of course had segregated visiting times. And when you look through our archives, you see that they had certain days when, um, when black students were able to come through and certain days when the white students were able to come through. But that was really forward thinking for 1902 Richmond. We're talking about the year in which the Virginia constitution was passed um, elite, you know, uh, disintegrating the the vote for Black Virginians um, and and half of uh, poor White Virginians as well. Um, the for the Valentine Jackson Ward has been. Um, has been a, a tricky thing, right? It's been a, a critical component of the city and yet it is not a piece that for most of our institution's history, we've done a really good job of capturing those stories. And if we have, it's kind of been happenstance. Um, uh, Dr. Kimball, um, dear Greg, in your, your time and your tenure at the Valentine in the 80s and 90s was really one of the first times that the institution began to focus on the history of African Americans in Richmond. And so you and your colleagues who are working here at the institution um, during those years, I think really elevated the, the discourse in the city about these critical neighborhoods, Jackson Ward, um, um, Randolph, so many of these other neighborhoods um, that have continued to, to serve as cultural touchstones for, um, for the city. Um, also during those years is when we had some fantastic exhibitions um, that were related to the histories um, that, that we're talking about today. And again, where we were the, the first institution in the city to really delve into these topics, including some in-depth looks at Jackson Ward and, and our collection started to grow at that time. Um, but, but right now for us at the Valentine Museum, really thinking about Jackson Ward, we are doing a complete refinement of our collection. And as we're going through, we are researching every object in our collection and trying to figure out how many stories those objects can tell. Um, and within the last few months, we've been able to uncover more um, dresses by a, a, a black Richmond dressmaker. Um, she was a fashion designer, Fanny Chris Payne. She operated in Jackson Ward. She was a high-end designer um, in the 1890s and early 1900s uh, coming out of Richmond. And in looking through our collections, we discovered that we had not only one, um, but actually three dresses that were made by, by Fanny Chris Payne, worn by white Richmonders and preserved, not because they were designed by her, but because they were worn by these white Richmonders. And for, for us now at the Valentine, we're able to understand more about her, her career. Um, she eventually moves up to, to Harlem and has a um, massive success in the New York fashion scene. Um, but her roots were in Jackson Ward and because we have been Richmond's attic for so long, we have these Jackson Ward stories that we're now able to share um, and, and tell in a more robust way. Um, and we just, they've been there, they've been languishing. And so that's what the Valentine is really trying to do now is to highlight these voices and these stories um, that we haven't always been able to share or even known those things that we're hiding in our closet. And let me add on here that much of this history that we're talking about uh, has been in front of us all the time. We just have not looked at it from the different perspectives. That's why it's so important to have uh, d diverse groups of people or individuals exploring our history and not looking at it from that one way. And in many ways that has been the Virginia way, which is where white elites decide 
for everyone how society should be, how, how they should move forward, particularly around race relations. So it's really important that we understand what Richmond's place was in this Virginia way and Jackson Ward as well, the resistance of people. Lauren, Ed, I, I want to jump on that and I want to thank you for bringing up Dr. Toppin. You know, we, we forget there was <laughs> there was Luther Porter Jackson at Virginia State and there was, you know, a Roscoe Lewis who led the Negro in Virginia project on the WPA at uh, down at Hampton. I mean, you know, <laughs> we're not we're not creating the first version of this history, <laughs> right? It was not the mainstream history, but black people have always been writing about their past uh, in honest ways. It just, it, you know, we have a copy of Du Bois's Black Reconstruction in the library and there's marginalia clearly written by some white guy that's taking issue with everything that, that Du Bois says. Well, guess what? We now know Du Bois was absolutely right about Black Reconstruction. <laughs> it's just the mainstream story was not that story. So I, I just wanna co-sign you know, we all standing on the shoulders of people who are largely ignored outside the black community in their own time. So I'm, I'm going to use that as a segue point. Um, and, and I'm going to read this question. And I really when um, Dr. Lee, when you spoke about the different lenses and Dr. Kimball, you spoke about it, too. I was listening to you, um, Ms. Vita, and, and thinking about um, what Professor Is was talking about when he was talking about hip hop because there was this whole hip hop revolution in the 80s and, and the 90s um, that he was speaking about. Um, Dr. Lee, you were talking about, you know, we kind of glossed over what you spoke about, but the depth of the trauma that you experienced in Chesterfield and how that was simultaneously happening in Virginia. And you have, have, have consistently mentioned the Virginia way. Um, so let me, I'm gonna read this question and I want everybody, if you can, who would like to, to jump on the question to, to answer so that we can hear the different perspectives and lenses. The Virginia way is a phrase that is often used to describe the Commonwealth's longstanding tradition of willfully suppressing history, specifically African American history, which is an ideological myth that is rooted in historical revisionism suggesting that the old dominion is the birthplace of great statesmen who were countly honest and ethical. This myth is often tethered to a lost cause. How does your work and or your institution, how is your work and or your institution answering the call to help the state correct the course towards a more just cause? That's the long question, but I really, really kind of want to dig into your analysis of the Virginia way and Virginia's history of suppressing African history and what that means. So I really kind of want us to have like, if we could take like a couple of minutes to have like a really deeply rooted philosophical discussion um, on that and analysis on that. Um, I will let um, whoever wants to start, start and I'll, I'll take a go at it. Um, I, I'm really, when Dr. Moon asked if I would participate on this panel, I really saw this as an opportunity to help share some of the recent research that's been conducted at the University of Richmond and which I directed. Uh, the research was done by Suzanne Sly. She's a master's uh, student. And um, the title of the report that she uh, did is The Virginia Way, Race, the Lost Cause, and the Social Influences of Douglas Southall Freeman. Um, and this report is focused on the impact that Freeman had on the city of Richmond, the University of Richmond, and the nation. And he was uh, a, an editor of the um, Richmond news leader for many years. 
um, over 35 years, I believe, and he was well known throughout the nation. Um, he was on WRVA, the, the uh, radio program. He, he was broadcast twice a day. He met with ad, ad presidents. He advised um, military uh, leaders and his roots were Confederate. His father fought in the Confederate War. Uh, Freeman himself believed very strongly in Confederate ideals and really perpetuated this idea of the Virginia way. Uh, the belief system among Virginia elites that it was their duty to govern through quote, genteel brand of paternalism, end quote. And they, they were intent on maintaining the social traditions and managing issues of race as they had seen it um, and experienced it prior to the Civil War, but recognizing that things had changed. So how were they to manage this new social order? Um, and so uh, there was a transactional kind of relationship between the elite whites and uh, the growing population of uh, middle-class Blacks. That is, Freeman and many others believed that uh, the Virginia Negroes were the best Negroes in America. I should have said, quote, end quote. That is how he wrote it in the editorials, 1926. You will find those editorials at the Library of Virginia. Thank you, Greg, and all of the, your, everyone there who made it possible for us to do this research. And uh, Freeman and many who considered themselves elite whites, thought that they were doing this for not only the betterment of, uh, of society, but Negroes themselves, that it was their duty to look out for these Negroes. That is part of that Virginia way, very much connected with the lost cause. And you could see that Virginia way still, uh, the remnants of that still in our society today particularly when you look at the behavior and actions of politicians. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Um, Dr. Vita, Professor Is, and um, Dr. Kimball. Jump I'm on. gonna, I would love to amplify um, what, what you were saying, Laurenette, just about this elite white, um, white set of Richmonders that were crafting this narrative um, after the war and, and one of those men that was involved in crafting the narrative both in terms of his writings and also in the artwork that he created was Edward Valentine. Um, now I work at the Valentine Museum. Edward Valentine was the brother of our museum's founder. He was also the um, Richmond sculptor who created the Jefferson Davis statue that was installed on Monument Avenue in 1907 and, and brought down in, in 2020. He was also our museum's first president. And in those roles, he helped to craft not only um, additional narratives of white supremacy and, and racial oppression, he physically crafted these racist caricatures that were not necessarily part of Richmond's public art, but they were living in people's parlors. They were being shipped to New England. They were being shipped out to California. Um, one of them was a, a portrayal of a man who had been enslaved by the Valentine family. His name is Henry Page. Um, and Henry Page's sculpture is not titled Henry Page using his first and last name. It's titled Uncle Henry. And again, it gets back to that Virginia way of that, that paternalism um, and not allowing these individuals who were now free after the Civil War to have their own lives. Now, now Henry Page does continue to work for the Valentine family. And indeed, he sits for this portrait um, for for Edward Valentine. And I'm sure that Henry Page did not know that the work was gonna be titled Uncle Henry Ancient Regime, right? Ancient Regime, the way, the best way, the way it used to be before the war was of course better than it is than it is now. And so Edward Valentine is helping to craft these narratives along with other Richmond sculptors. He also crafts additional racist characters of, of young black boys, um, one of which is called a nation's ward and the other is called Knowledge is Power, depicting um, a young black boy sleeping while holding a book. 
Um, and so these, these are sort of private artworks that help contribute again to that private thought. And what do private thoughts do? but they get implemented into public policies. And so when you see these artworks going up around Richmond, obviously on Monument Ave um, and, and Libby Hill, and when you see what people were, were reading in the newspaper from, from Douglas Freeman, when you see what they were reading, the, the work of Edward Pollard, The Lost Cause, right? It's published, um, published right here in Richmond um, in, in 1866. And so you, you kind of understand that the, the white pervasive culture was crafting this very paternalistic narrative and yet there exists other sources that we get to point to right so we can now highlight those they weren't silent we just haven't been publishing them in our history books thanks to the UDC and other leaders um, but we have this moment now where we can re-look at those same primary sources and begin to highlight them and sh share the voices that have been left out of our history books um, for so long. And I should also add the Valentine's collections, right? Um, so we get now to, to make room for more stories, better stories, um, and, and elevate those voices. I also want to add too that um, in terms of the Valentine Museum, the way that we were structured when we initially opened was a Western civilization museum. So you came, you saw classical white sculptures, um, and, and you then would walk up into the ethnographic and the archaeological collections. And these archaeological collections, I know we're talking about um, suppressing Black history, but I also do have to talk about um, the Native American histories. And the founders of the Valentine Museum were also amateur archaeologists, and they decimated burial mounds in Western Virginia and Western North Carolina, and then presented these remains um, of, of Native Virginians um, in a very insensitive manner. And we are now, thankfully, from the 1990s onwards, have removed those um, remove those human remains and are now complying even more with NAGPRA. Um, but still those, again, it takes, we're talking about a century later, right? For us to be able to course correct um, and think of all of the students that have gone through our buildings that have gone through the classrooms um, in that time frame, And it all it takes is, right, um, uh, Lorinette, something that you hear in the fourth grade and it sticks with you for a lifetime. And so I'm so glad um, that folks like, like Dr. Iz are, are getting in there and doing the hard work um, with educators and inspiring young minds to these new stories. Yes. Professor Iz. Yeah, I, I, I'll say that when you talk about the erasure the erasure of African history, right? I think it's ironic that during this time where there are districts that are outlawing any discussion of race, right? This misunderstanding of this supposed infiltration of the evil CRT um, is that what's really happening is a renewed neo-reconstructionism of the mind. The, the history is cyclical. And so the, and notice I didn't say cyclical, but cyclical uh, because there is a sickness in some who want to continue to revisit the past, uh, which has proven to be incorrect. And again, one of the speeches that I love, and when, when we talk about the real Richmond course, and uh, we, we, we talk about the AR technology we have set up for the city, uh, coming after September the 12th, one of the speeches that is one of the most difficult speeches to find is the cornerstone speech by Alexander Stevens. And it's like, it's not on uh, a library of congress.gov. I can't find it anywhere. But I, I, it's the irony is that people today want to cover up, uh, revisit this lost cause type of, uh, uh, of way of thinking when clearly it states and I'll quote <laughs> that our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite idea, talking about those that were written in the declaration. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition. This our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. I mean, that's, that's a heck of a speech. And for us to pretend as if 
this didn't exist, as if this wasn't clearly postured before the world, right? Only some less than a decade after the words were spoken, it shows that we have not as a nation wanted to wrestle with the realities of life. And so I think that it's, it's extremely important for us to recognize that the centering of white thought, white culture, and Eurocentric ideas is the dismissing of African understanding by default in this society that has been racialized and built upon this construct of, of race. And that's not CRT, my friend. That's just T-R-U-T-H, right? It's not something that we can argue. So we have to, at every moment, contend for this truth and let it be known. I, I'll say this before, before I close up. Look, we know about E. Franklin Frazier, the famous sociologist who in his ideas on the Negro race and family uh, postulates that Africans came to America without culture, bereft of the knowledge of their past, but it's in our very DNA right? In the foods that we eat, in the seasonings that we use, in the way that we wear our garments, it's a part of us. So the objective for what we do in, in, in Richmond Public Schools and what we do uh, in the Leading by History Collective is to confront uh, the reality of African culture, African tradition, and Black history so that it is centered in the minds of children who have been harmed by its dismissal for the last several centuries. That was so powerful. You have to come to Virginia State and um, lecture my class. Um, Dr. Kimball, we have three minutes and I have a very important question that I definitely want to direct to Dr. Barry, but I definitely, I don't know if you wanna follow that, but I definitely wanna hear your thoughts on that. And then Dr. Barry, I'm coming to you um, for the final question. If we don't have any, um, any questions from our audience, then we can continue the discussion, but go ahead, Dr. Kimball. Yeah, just really quickly, one of the things I really like to teach with, and that is with, you know, people that are from the communities of people that, that come to the library and are from our community. You know, one of the things that um, I ask people sometimes is, how many African Americans do you think have served in the General Assembly? Well, they probably know some of the current legislators. They might even know Ferguson Reed, who is the first 20th century. And well, guess what? There were over 90 African Americans who served in the General Assembly. So we talk about statesmen in this you know, question. You know, we think automatically of Jefferson. No, there were they, during, after Reconstruction up until the 1890s, there were a large number of African Americans who were serving in the General Assembly. You know, doing the, the, the business of government, sophisticated men uh, who, who knew what they were about, entrepreneurs, people like Ballard Edwards from Chesterfield County, who I know that Laurenette will be familiar with. I mean, nobody knows that. How, how is it that we don't know about these men? So we did a project with the uh, Martin Luther King Commission, uh, which is a state commission, where we have written biographies of all of these men, they're almost completed, um, to, to give them the honor that they really deserve. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kimball. So Dr. Barry, you are the Associate Provost of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at VCU. So this last question is all yours. And I would like for you to slow walk it if you need to slow walk it and then we'll go to um, our Q&A. Um, but the state is currently investing in institutions and initiatives that are helping to drive historic justice. Understanding that at, that at a time when the Commonwealth and country are grappling with how to present a more complete and honest picture of our complex history, we must work to enhance public spaces that have long been neglected and shine a light on previously untold stories. Can you share with us about your institution's current commitment to cultivating a more just, diverse, equitable, inclusive, and accessible public space? 
And thank you. And again, you know, I've been at VCU a month and I have observed VCU though as a Richmonder for many years. Um, and I think there's been a lot of fair critique about the expansion of VCU and how it has taken over Richmond and, um, you know, the ways in which the university has probably ignored uh, the native residents, primarily black folks. Um, but I have been heartened to be on the inside um, to have a better understanding um, that there is a true commitment to centering um, justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that this work um, didn't just start um, after the murders of um, Breonna Taylor and um, George Floyd. And so um, the university has worked to try to um, decommemorate um, buildings and monuments with ties um, that were named after folks with ties to the Confederacy. Um, and in current standing, um, you know, these challenges are complex, um, but, you know, through continued transparency by partnering with key stakeholders, they're trying to infuse community stories. Uh, one great example um, that I can speak of recently, the university's Da Vinci Center, which is a center of innovation, um, uh, created an entrepreneurship academy with uh, the Jackson Ward Collective, which is led by phenomenal Black women, uh, Rashida Creighton, Melody Short, and Kelly Lemon. Um, and they're working to connect Black entrepreneurs uh, with resources. And so this partnership brings together students um, from minoritized and underrepresented backgrounds, first-gen students, um, together with community members to engage in this design thinking um, and business literacy um, to culminate in this student storefront um, that hopefully um, will engage the community and um, bring a light to businesses um, in Jackson Ward. And so we know that Jackson Ward is the space between the Monroe Park campus and the MCV campus. Um, and I see uh, that the university is working with intentionality um, to try to preserve spaces in that area um, and to bring unheard voices um, into the decision-making process. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, so we do have a question. Um, I, I want to do take a, a few minutes to do question and answer. Um, and then at the end, I do want to give you all a few minutes to just kind of give um, closing remarks. So we have a question in the chat from Tanya Pruitt. And she asks, can you talk more about the real Richmond uh, history class and what we, and I guess this is directed to you, um, Professor Is, and what we need to do to make this not an elective, but a regular inclusive part of all history courses taught in Virginia. And can it be made available online beyond K-12, K through 12 for all Virginians? Professor Is. I, I would say theoretically, yes, to all of those. Um, I'm not that shot caller, but what I would say is if we continue to get people to express that this is something that they want for the public, um, then of course, I think it's something that can branch. But let me say this, we do have a public component now coming. After September 12th, we're gonna have an augmented reality uh, system set up that will span from the library, I mean, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts um, from the, uh, from the work there of uh, Candy, and it's gonna go all the way down uh, monument. Um, and every place where the statues, I didn't say monuments, this, where the statues were removed, we've had uh, digital architects, right? And artists work to reproduce those so that as you walk through that tour, you can put up your uh, mobile device, you'll see video, um, you'll hear audio, you'll get more history, you'll be able to, you know, get uh, context. And so that's going to be set up for the community to, to, to be able to enjoy uh, in the coming months. So we want to make that clear. Real Richmond is a course right now that's a high school course. We're working on middle school and elementary versions of that as we go forward. We really need the support of the community. Feel free to come out at the end of the year, every June, uh, the week of the 10th, we, we normally do our um, capstone projects where all of the students have to produce research. 
real research and they present to uh, prestigious places like Hampton U, Virginia Union, um, you know, Columbia University, et cetera. So there's a lot involved in this course and we could have an entire session just talking about it, but I'm glad that people have heard about it, that you wanna know more about it. And let me throw this out there real quick. Go to www.growhistoryrps.com www.growhistoryrps.com. You'll see the kind of work that we're doing in Richmond, but then there's a tab at the very end for real Richmond and you can actually watch the capstone projects that were presented this past year. And you can stay up on what's going on with real Richmond through that website. Hope that helps. Thank you so much, Professor Is. Dr. Moon, I think, I'm not sure if you have your hand up. Go ahead. I do. Well, first of all, I agree with whoever said they wish we had a whole nother hour um, because I wish we did too. You know, I just have to chime in through a Jackson lens real quick for a couple of themes that I heard. You know, first up, when we think about the fact that Jackson has partnered with the Library of Virginia, we partner with Richmond Times Dispatch, we've partnered with the Valentine. Some of these institutions, you would say, well, why are they doing that? And we really believe because reparations can come in several different forms and reparations can be payment. Sometimes it can be partnership. Sometimes it can be platforms. And to be able to have this conversation tonight with the Library of Virginia, and we've been having these frank, honest conversations all summer. I think that when we talk about institutions uh, feeling a commitment to redefine the Virginia way, this is what that can look like. But more importantly, when we talk about the truth being there, what I've learned just in the year that we've been doing this Jackson research is sure the, act, the artifacts might be there, but access to said artifacts is the responsibilities of the institutions. And so one thing that we are working with Library of Virginia and the Valentine is to give legitimate access. And so when we think about DEI and accessibility, I think that's another thing. Um, when we also think about Jackson research, you know, we're in the middle of discussions to hopefully make the research into an exhibition with Library of Virginia. And when we think about the question just now for Professor Is about an elective, one of the things that we had a conversation with Greg about is we do not want for this exhibition to start in the exhibition space where you have to opt into learning the truth. We want for the truth to hit you before you even come in the door, that you have to learn the truth, not because it's on your terms when you want to know it. And so I think that's another thing. Um, there's been a lot of conversation about Black voices telling Black stories. And so for institutions that are curating these collections for Black truths that have been there that now are just of, of recent interest, there is a responsibility to make sure that Black people are telling Black stories. And so I think that that's um, something that needs to be stated. And then two more things. Um, when we talk about erasure, and Professor Is mentioned that, it made me think about unveiling the vanguard, which is, you know, if you're on the line um, on October 2nd, we'll be unveiling 15 honorary street signs across Jackson Ward for notable Jackson Wardians. And as a first step, we were very intentional about doing honorary signs to juxtapose the black notable Jackson Wardians with the current street signs, most of which are named after Confederate soldiers, enslavers, or, or pro-slavery sympathizers who were the perpetuators and the originators of the lost cause. And that's because doing, just taking the green signs down immediately actually does whiteness a favor. We help erase it. And so not saying that the street signs will stay up forever, but for a second, they're gonna intersect so that you have to tell the truth, so that you have to say, well, why is Lee intersecting with Bilbo Jangles Robinson Boulevard? And so local uh, Richmonders have to ask, visitors have to ask, and you force people into the truth on why are these intersections um, you know, reflective of two different versions of history, which brings me to my last point, and then I'm off my soapbox. Um, when we think about monuments, you know, Jackson Project, even though it started off with who is Jackson, we never knew that compelling evidence would suggest that it was Stonewall because we'd always believe it was Giles B. Now, was it surprising when you understand that Jackson Ward was established during Reconstruction? Absolutely not. But now that we know the answer about that and the street signs, our next goal is to decenter a focus on the monuments and to start to recenter our own. In every lecture, I mentioned Abraham Peyton skip with, he will have a street sign unveiled for him. He is the first black homeowner in Jackson Ward. He built the home there in 1793. 
those are not the truths, you know, when, when, when Professor is talked about bars, you know, or, or the truth, T-R-U-T-H, you know, we, we hear that Black wealth, Black excellence, and the shoulders that we stand on started in like the 1870s, early 1900s. But the truth is that they're standing on a whole century worth of shoulders. And so when we, when we talk about all of our responsibility, it's also for us to do the work to try to uncover these truths for ourselves with access in partnership with institutions across the city. And so I'm done. Thank you guys for a moment to chime in. And tonight was dope. Stay on for a second, Dr. Moon, don't leave. We only have four minutes and I doubt, but I have to ask this question. It's my question. So I'm going to take my moderator liberties. I would like for you all, if you could like run through and briefly talk about how do we balance symbolically eradicating symbolisms and artifacts of a racist history with ensuring that it doesn't lead to an erasure of history itself. Please, somebody, somebody jump in. Well, I, I'll, I see everybody sort of like doing the double dutch, uh, get ready to jump in. I'll just say that, um, you know, we have to be very mindful when we think that to undo the centering of wrong, we simply erase it. Because with it, and it's a race erasure, uh, goes out with it the history and the knowledge of who did it, or, or as they used to say, who done it, right? Um, we want to make sure that, because then you let people off the hook. If you just erase their history, then you, you don't know the, the evil that was done. You don't know the wrong that was done but you still live with its reverberation. So we have to be mindful to not just want to bulldoze over things because we don't want to see them or because they are eyesores to us or because they cause us some, some form of, of, of mental harm, which should never be understated. We also want to be mindful that we need to make sure that people look dead in the face, the history of their forefathers and foremothers and what was done so that you never repeat that thing again. And, and just to piggyback, I think, you know, as he said, you know, this creates physical and psychological trauma for generations, but there is a balance between erasing and exalting. And so where do we find that fine line and then meet in the middle on educating? And I think that that's where we are, but I understand sometimes you feel like swing, uh, the pendulum has to swing so sharply to the other side, but we must be careful um, when you understand whiteness and supremacist mindsets and the architectural blueprint that is Richmond and the lost cause and the concept of erasure. So I think that as you talk about cyclical, that's why research matters. Being a historian matters. Go back in time and see the blueprint so that you don't repeat. And, and what we're talking about here is historiography, right? It's the history of history. And so to, to think of history as layers or chapters in a book that continue to build on each other, we get to reference the bad and the good and the new and the old, and we don't have to ignore it. You need to get through it all to understand where we are today. And the beauty of what we do is that our kids, our grandkids are gonna go, what the heck were they thinking? this and rewrite the script as well you know we're just here for this moment we get to tell the stories tell the truths so that a generation from now two generations from now they can continue to build on that and tell the histories and the stories and the ways that are meaningful for them so i think for us to dig into this to dig into the history of history and educate and not be afraid to say you know they had it wrong or this is this is not the way it should have been um we we have to embrace that that scaredness, right? We have to embrace that, not be afraid to, to get uncomfortable. Um, and, and, you know, it's the thing that we're looking forward to doing um, even more of at the Valentine. Yeah, I, my feeling is I'm a huge proponent of, like, it's not a zero sum game. You have to, you know, teaching African American history, absolutely. But the thing that seems to be really upsetting a lot of white folks right now is the centering of black history in our history, right? 
So when the 1619 project, why is it controversial, right? It's because it centers black people in a way that makes Americans very uncomfortable. So I want that. That's that had if that one book you read in fifth grade doesn't include those stories, then you've lost because that's as someone else said, that's what's in people's heads. They think that's the story. So I'm a huge proponent of that. Um, we we need both. I think that. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just think that the, the educational institutions, K through 12, higher ed, has to continue to take an active role in acknowledging the history, right? We're correcting, we're trying to correct course, right? We have to stay focused on acknowledging and still continuing to reteach. I have a fourth grader, and so this will be very interesting this year in Loudoun County, what they will teach him. I'll keep y'all posted. Yes. And we see this national movement uh, out of the University of Virginia, universities studying slavery, institutions of higher learning are really delving deep into their own history and looking at the roots of, of their founding. Um, and when I think about, I think it was Socrates who said that an unexamined life is not worth living. So it is with history too. If we don't examine our history, it's not worth re retelling. We've got to keep examining the roots of our, our history and in fact, our identity, as Professor Is said. Well, Dr. Moon, I will um, pass it back to you, but as the moderator, I am really, really excited and thankful to each one of you for your knowledge. I wanna thank the people who posted the, the links in the chat as well was really powerful. Um, and Dr. Moon, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this very, very imperative conversation. So I'll turn it back to you. Well, first of all, just thank you. I think that Dr. Lee, you know, you brought it full circle. Jackson is rooted in trying to unearth origin stories. And so thank you just for closing that out. You know, on behalf of myself and Anjali, just thank you guys. Thank you guys for being you. Thank you guys, you know, DEI, anti-racism work, it's on trend right now. But several of you on the line have been doing this work well before it, it, it's become the thing. When you could have lost your careers, where you could have lost your lives, where you could have been locked up for doing this work. So thank you um, on behalf of the Moon Sisters for just doing, doing the work and being yourselves. Um, tonight was awesome. For those on the line that want to share, for those who could not join, it will be on our website. Um, and uh, I can't believe that the summer series is almost over, Greg. I feel like we just started, but next month will be the last one. It's going to be on the rested and readied. And we're going to take a deeper dive on all of the 15 notable Black Jackson Wardians who will be honored with unveiling the Vanguard on October 2nd. Um, we're going to have Janine Bell. We're going to have Gary Flowers. We're going to have Gina Rogers. And we're going to have Mary Lauderdale from the Black History Museum. And it is going to be a grand finale of a lecture. And so thank you guys for um, sharing sharing your voice, sharing your expertise, and I hope everybody stays safe out there, okay? Thank you. Thank Peace you so much. Thanks, everyone. Peace be with you. Bye. Thank you, guys.